Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction. In this particular lecture, we will begin with T.S. Eliot's poem The Wasteland, which is one of the most canonical texts of high modernism. So in my previous lecture, I just uh, had a summary discussion on Eliot's early poetry and I ended the lecture with a request uh, for you to read up the poem Wasteland before you come to this particular lecture and I am sure most of you have done that already. Now, the reason why we come into Wasteland after the early poetry of Eliot, we find how some of the characteristics of that early poetry like the love song of J. Prufrock, Prelude, the two poems you have done, we find some of the stylistic elements get uh, carried over into this particular poem as well. Now the only difference between Wasteland and the early poetry of Eliot, the, I mean there are many differences but the fundamental difference is in this particular poem Eliot is using what he himself would describe as the mythic method. Right, which is a uh, term that he used to describe James Joyce's Ulysses, which is another text which we'll do in due codes. Now, what the mythic method means is that it, you know, Eliot uses lots of ancient myths, uh, European myths, non-European myths, in terms of uh, localizing them in the current context, in the contemporary context. So he uses myths of Tiresias, he uses myths of Lazarus, he uses myths of you know, different other uh, European origin, and he also uh, alludes to uh, non-European uh, uh, you know, myths and religious figures as well. Uh, and non-European uh, you know, allusions, non-European references. For instance, uh, the whole poem ends with uh, the reference to Shanti, 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 which is obviously uh, the end of, you know, it, it features in Bhagavad Gita, which is something Eliot was very, very interested in as, as a reader. Now, what that does is that it makes Wasteland into a very interesting collage of quotations. Uh, he's sort of taking in different things from different cultural contexts, he's quoting, um, straight quoting certain passages from certain canonical books. So there are references to Edmund Spencer, the references to, uh, you know, uh, Baudelaire, of course. Uh, French symbolist poetry is a large part, it informs Eliot's poetry quite heavily. Uh, it informs uh, Dante's Inferno and Dante's Divine, Divine Comedy in general. So there's a whole series of references in the Wasteland which uh, in which can be found and there's a different research altogether. I mean we can actually have an entire research uh, looking at the references in Wasteland I and mean, what are the references coming from. So it's quite encyclopedic uh, in its quality. It brings in a huge and enormous range of references uh, from Christianity, from anthropology, uh, from non-Christian uh, religions such as Hinduism, uh, as, along with uh, you know, alluding to different literary texts of different cultural and political times, uh, all of which come together to create this very marvelous and astonishing collage the Eliot is uh, presenting in the wasteland. And now, this particular poem is, is dedicated to Ezra Pound, uh, Il Miligo Fabro, so the superior poet. Uh, Pound was someone who was instrumental in editing The Wasteland and what we see now is a very heavily edited version. I mean the, long, the original poem was much longer and Pound uh, cut off huge chunks from the poem in terms of making it more lean. Uh, but what we find at the end of Wasteland interestingly is a, a note of references, series of references, certain things that Eliot had quoted. Uh, some of the references are apocryphal, some of the references are academic. Uh, so in a way that it's a very interesting way to muscle up the poem and we can talk about the politics of representation in Wasteland, how this entire poem can be read as a very, very hysteric, uh, you know, statement of uh, the collapse of European civilization and the, uh, the, the final series of quotations, the final series of references in the end is just an effort to academize it, to make it more academic, to make it more uh, scholarly. So, you know, it's a very interesting thing to have references to the end of the poem, which is something Eliot, uh, you know, did. And obviously this poem uh, fetched him a lot of fame and a lot of money, but uh, there's also a poem which is quite possibly the most personal thing he wrote at that point of time, uh, The Wasteland. Now, in a nutshell, the wasteland is about the collapse of European civilization. It's the wasteland. It's very dystopian. It's uh, everything has come to an end. Uh, spirituality, religion, um, the very fundamental sustenance the Western civilization had provided human beings is coming to an end now. 
And obviously, the location of the poem is important. Uh, temporally speaking, it is right after the First World War. 1922 was the date of publication for this poem, which is like, uh, you know, four years after the uh, World War ended, or three years actually, uh, the World War ended. And the entire memory, the trauma of the war is still very much there in, in this particular poem. Uh, it just comes up uh, with some very superficial references. Uh, there's, a, there's a dialogue between two sort of quote unquote working class women who were talking about their husbands coming back from the war. Uh, the husbands are obviously bruised, wounded soldiers, and that's the only time the war is actually mentioned in the poem. But the reference to war is very tangentially and very, very uh, complexly done. It's a very complex form of representation that is being uh, presented over here in the wasteland. Now, uh, the war is a very spectral presence in most modernist uh, works. Like, for instance, uh, if you take a look at Mrs. Dalloway, uh, which is entirely about the war, and which is a text which will do in due course uh, by Virginia Woolf, which is essentially about a PTSD victim, a person, a soldier coming back from the war and finding it difficult to acclimatize or reintegrate in the civilian space, right? The civilian space of uh, uh, um, you know, a post-war metropolis. And now, even there, the war is not really directly mentioned. There's very oblique references to war, uh, which actually make it more sinister, which make it more, uh, more spectral in quality, more chilling in quality. So there's no graphic representation of the war, there's no graphic description of the war as such, but even the way it is obliquely mentioned, the oblique references to the war actually make it more chilling, make it more clinical in terms of being a spectral presence. Okay? So that is something which we find even in Eliot's early poetry, especially in the wasteland, where you know, those references come up in a very creepy and sinister way, uh, which is sort of subtly present in, uh, in a very subterranean sense, subliminal sense, uh, never really foregrounded. But just because of that, it's something which we can never get um, you know, rid of. It's, it's always there staring at you from some spectral position. Okay? So that's something which we will be interested in, and that's something which we will pay some attention to as we move on in this poem. Now, for practical purposes, uh, because we, we're dealing with this poem in details, uh, we'll be focusing on certain issues more heavily than the other issues. And th that focus is important for the purpose of examination, for the purpose of this particular course on modernist fiction. And one of the uh, very, very key things that we will uh, uh, spend some time on is the representation of politics, right? So how is, uh, how are emotions represented? How is trauma represented, for instance? How is uh, consciousness represented? Right, so these are things, these are issues which we have seen uh, right from uh, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, and, and which is essentially one of the first modernist works in fiction. That's why we start with Heart of Darkness, when you look at Western European modernism. Now, that degree of horror and the, in, the inability to, to narrate the horror, to narrate the trauma, is something which we find in Wasteland as well. Uh, there is a lot of, it's a very traumatophilic city. It's a city which consumes trauma all the time, and that's something which we see in Mrs. Jalloway. Uh, trauma becomes a norm, so the entire idea of staying in shock, staying in shudder, constant shudder, that becomes a norm uh, in Wasteland, and that, that norm is something which is dramatized. Okay, now the very first section, which is entitled The Burial of the Dead, you know, this is obviously about uh, huge populations of dead people and how they're buried. Now, obviously, this has a Christian allusion, the battle of the dead. It has Dantesque allusions and the references of Dante throughout the poem. But more, uh, more topically, this is also an allusion to the dead soldiers of the First World War who came in. All right? And like you said, the war is never really mentioned except in one particular passage. But throughout the poem, we know that given the historical time in which it was produced, this particular poem, it is very much a war poem. It is very much a poem about the war, from the war, post-war. It is about a, a post-war metropolis. Uh, and its coping mechanisms, and the failure in such coping mechanisms. Rather, how does the metropolis cope, and how does it actually uh, fail to cope? And this this failure to cope becomes a very important uh, human condition in this particular poem. So let's take a look at the uh, opening section of the wasteland uh, from the first section, which is entitled "The Burial of the Dead." So, and this should be on the screen. And that's how the poem opens. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Summer surprised us, coming over the Stamberg Sea with a shower of rain, we stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the half garden and drank coffee. 
and talk for an hour. Benga Khan Russian, Stam A. Luden, Archduke, and when we were children, staying at the Archduke's. My cousins, he took me out on a sled, and I was frightened. He said, Mary, Mary, hold on tight. And down we went in the mountains. There you feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. Now, you find that there's a very interesting narrative, there's a series of narrative leaps uh, in a very opening section. So, uh, there is this unnamed speaker who is uh, presented, uh, who presents this particular section and is presumably focalized to that speaker's eye. And we can presume that the speaker is a woman called Mary, and then she is narrating some experience which happened to him, happened to her when she was a child. And you find that this particular experience is actually quite dark. It could be an experience of sexual exploitation, it could be an ex experience of sexual violence, which is never really spelled out. Uh, but you know, there's a series of very, very coded, covert uh, communication uh, which are being represented, which are being conveyed to us. Uh, you know, which may mean uh, some very, very dark and sinister things. Now, the very opening of April being the cruelest month, right, it's something which uh, breathes lilacs out of the dead land. And that image of lilacs coming out of the dead land becomes interesting because the land is dead. So the entire landscape becomes one of deadness, becomes one of uh, complete stillness and infertility. However, you know, from this infertile dead land, we have lilacs coming out. So it's almost like a, uh, you know, cactus-like quality. It's almost like a cancer-like quality about this kind of regeneration. It's not really a regeneration in a spiritual sense. It's something which has been produced out of a dead land, out of a dead uh, tumor existence, a tumorous existence, uh, which actually makes this actually quite sinister and clinical in quality. This lilacs coming out of dead land. Now. Immediately after this, you find a series of opposites which are mixed together, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. So memory and desire, uh, dull roots and spring rain. So these are apparent contradictions and these are come together, these come together to create a very ambivalent situation, a very ambivalent attitude which is being uh, described to here. And then that ambivalence uh, uh, continues when the speaker says, winter kept us warm covering earth in a forgetful snow. So we begin to realize that warm over here doesn't necessarily mean uh, the warmth in weather conditions. Warm can also be, uh, also be uh, used to mean an existential warmth, a lack of coolness, a lack of deadness. Why? Because the earth in winter is covered in forgetful snow. So snow breeds oblivion, a snow breeds uh, amnesia uh, to a certain extent. Uh, and that we can say, we can hazard a guess, that given that this is a post war poem, uh, the snow that comes, it fills in and covers all the graveyards. It covers all the dead soldiers and dead people's uh, and on graves. So we don't quite see them. And when everything gets snow filled and everything gets snow covered, then what happens is, you know, that produces, that generates amnesia, that generates oblivion in a very, uh, you know, natural material way. And that material production of oblivion to snow becomes important because again, what we see here is something which we have already seen and preludes and that is how material markets and abstract effect they come together to produce very complex cognitive conditions which is something which we saw even in uh, uh, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Okay, and now we cut into uh, a very German setting uh, which is uh, described to us. Now what's important for us is to understand that when you have Germans and Russians come together, it's actually a European condition which has been described to here in, in great details. Some have surprised us coming over the Strandberg Sea, uh, you know, and went on in sunlight with a shower of rain, we stopped in a colonnade and went on in sunlight in the half garden and drank coffee and talked for an hour. And then uh, there's a reference to whether we can speak Russian or whether we are German. And when we are children, staying at the Archdukes, so again, there's a reference to the Archdukes. So this is about very European, wealthy, white European privilege, which has been pointed out. But and immediately after that, we have this a very, very interesting image, a very interesting implication, a very interesting hint and insinuation of sexual exploitation, a sexual fall, perhaps. Uh, my cousins, he took me out on a sled and I was frightened. And he said, Mary, Mary, hold and tied and down we went. So again, the whole idea of going out with a cousin on a sled and holding on to him tied and I was frightened. And I was frightened. He said, Mary, Mary, hold and tied and down we went. So again, this whole down white, uh, you know, downward plummet, a downward, uh, down, down, downward fall, 
is something which can also be uh, seen as a fall, uh, as a sexual fall, a moral fall, as something which happened many years ago to the speaker when she was a child. And this whole idea of going with a cousin and then falling in the mountains uh, is very, very interestingly uh, depicted. It's very covert, as you can see. In the mountains, and down we went, in the mountains, there we feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter, right? So again, the whole idea of reading at night and going south in the winter, very European bourgeois uh, privilege activities, right? So the uh, demography over here in this particular section is a very white uh, privileged demography. So people who can read uh, for leisure, people who can go to south for leisure, uh, when things go a bit cold and, uh, and, and freezing, they can go south for warmer conditions. Okay, now immediately after that, we have the image of, again, deadness growing, right? And this image is something which keeps coming up in, in, in the wasteland. The, it's like a production of death, right? So growth in wasteland or fertility in wasteland is not really about regeneration. It's not really about uh, something which grows for uh, after death, right? So it's not really a posthumous, uh, not really a post-death phenomenon, right? What happens over here is actually more complex and more sinister and more, uh, and, and more dark. It's actually quite dark in the sense that we see the production of deadness. It's so a deadness as an activity is happening over here. So, you know, branches are growing out of rubbish. So, you know, uh, things are going out of dead lands. Uh, lilacs are going out of dead lands. So, again, that those things actually become markers, not of regeneration, but of posthumous reproduction, uh, which very much carry on uh, and retain the image of death, retain the, the effect of death, and the, the entire emotion, the entire experience of death is being retained even in this uh, cycles of birth, which are happening uh, after death. Okay? So this image of roots uh, and branches growing out of stony rubbish becomes very important. And that, that brings us to another very important issue in the wasteland. Among other things, this particular poem is also about the production of trash, the production of waste in the European metropolis. And that's something which we find really uh, is very dialogic and very interestingly uh, it opens up to different kinds of interpretations, especially uh, in modern studies of the environment, modern studies of uh, the, the, uh, the eco spare, and also about urban waste, right? So, Wasteland, this particular poem, is uh, among other things a, a poem about the production, <coughs> excuse me, and consumption of waste, right? And its production and consumption of waste is something which we find as a recursive marker of the metropolis. Uh, we have already seen this in the preludes, if you remember, the whole idea of the evening newspapers and you know the coffee cups, coffee marks, the coffee uh, paper cups, uh, you know, rustling uh, in the in the road along with the dead leaves. Uh, which very much become the part of the metropolis, they all come together to create a sense of waste, to create a sense of uh, trash, which is something which you find here as well in the wasteland. So the, the speaker goes on to say, and you know, this is what uh, you know, is being said, uh, what are the roots of that clutch? What branches grow out of the stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone, no sound of water. Only there is shadow under this red rock. Come in under the shadow of this red rock, and I will show you something different from either. Your shadow at morning striding behind you, or your shadow in the evening rising to, to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Right? So again, look at the way in which the different abstract macro markers are sort of brought together with very micro material markers. And the final image is something which I uh, just want to spend some time on and that is the whole idea of showing your fear in a handful of dust. So a handful of dust is something which you can contain, it's tangible, it's something we can touch, it's a very tactile experience to, to collect a handful of dust and to feel it. However, what the speaker says over here is interesting because you know what has been told to us as readers is that the entire idea of fear, the entire experience of fear can be contained and visualized and shown and represented in a handful of dust, right? So dust becomes very important. Again, it's a metaphor of waste, it's a metaphor of post-death uh, phenomenon which carries on the legacy, the experience of death, right? So there's no regeneration, there's no redemption available post-death. It's entirely about a, a, a continuation of the deadness of existence, whether it's in a natural landscape or the urban landscape or the existential landscape. They all carry on and retain uh, the image and experience of death, right? So that's something which is a recursive marker. Now, the next uh, section over here 
uh, where there's reference to the hyacinth girl. You gave me hyacinths first a year ago. They call me the hyacinth girl as a reference from Hamlet, as some of you would know. This is Ophelia in Hamlet, uh, who's, who becomes the image uh, of the drowning woman. And Ophelia, obviously, the sinking woman, the drowning woman. And if you remember, uh, the end of the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, it too had a sinking image, a drowning image. Do human voices wake us and we drown? Right, so the whole idea of drowning in time, the whole idea of drowning in existence is something which uh, is an activity which keeps coming up in Eliot's early poetry. And drowning, of course, uh, over here becomes an agency less activity. You lose your motor agency, you lose your limb movement, you lose your motor memory, you just sink in a particular fluid, and that becomes uh, part of the uh, drowning experience. Your arms full and your hair wet, I could not speak and my eyes failed. I could not, uh, you know, I was neither living nor dead and I know nothing, looking into the heart of other, the silence, right? Now, there's a quotation uh, again from, from German. Now, before that, let's take a look at the whole idea of living between, you know, existence and non-existence. It's a very liminal location between life and death. Uh, this is a very limbo state and again that, that reminds us of Dante and different circles of heaven and hell that are there in Dante's Divine Comedy. That's something the editor is constantly referring to over here, right? So the point is the whole idea of being stuck between life and death, uh, unable to move in life and death is something which we see in this particular poem. And that limbo state, that liminality is not really a productive liminality, it's a claustrophobic liminality, it's, it's a position, it's a, it's a condition where the human beings cannot move, there's no movement available, there's no motor movement available, right? And that's something which we find in Eliot's early poetry as well, this lack of, uh, this, this inertia, this lack of mobility, this lack of agency, which uh, on, consumes you at the level of motor movement, it consumes you at the level of the body, right? So your body cannot move, your limbs cannot move. Right, so that becomes a very, very uh, metabolic condition. It becomes a very, very embodied condition. Right, so it captures the, it arrests the movement of the body. Okay, and that that being arrested, it obviously becomes part of the stagnation, part of the spiritual stagnation, which is entirely what the wasteland is about. Okay, and now we find the whole idea of the clairvoyant, somebody who can uh, use tarot cards, for instance, uh, and take a look at the future. And again, this whole idea of someone looking at the future, someone who knows the time, someone who can sort of sit back and tell you what's going to happen to you and may not speak and may not actually tell you despite knowing what's going to happen to you. So you find that such figures have appeared uh, even in Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. So for instance, if you remember the novel, uh, before Kurtz goes out, uh, you know, before Kurtz goes to the, um, you know, the, the Belgian office, uh, he sees, uh, not Kurtz, Marlow, he sees a tree woman knitting wool and they do have a sort of prophetic presence in that particular scene. They seem to know what's about to befall Marlow, they seem to know what's about to happen to him but they wouldn't deign to speak, right? Now, Madame Cesatris over here uh, becomes an important figure because, you know, she's a clairvoyant, she's someone who plays the tarot cards and tell you about the future and that's what he, what she's about to say. Madame Cesatris, famous clairvoyant, had a bad cold Nevertheless, is known to be the wisest woman in Europe. So again, look at the idea of the coal, the bad coal is an image of congestion, right? So congestion, stagnation, something which uh, interrupts your movement, interrupts your free movement, right? And that lack of freedom which happens due to congestion, which happens due to production of waste, is something which we find coming back again and again in Eliot's early poetry, especially here in the wasteland. And she is known to be the wisest woman in Europe with a wicked pack of cards. Here, she said she, is your card, the drowned Phoenician soul sailor. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Look, here is Belladonna, the, the lady of the rocks, the lady of situations. Here is a man with three staves. And here the wheel, and here the one-eyed merchant, and this, this card, which is blank, is something he carries on his back, which I am forbidden to see. I do not find the hanged man, fear death by water, I see crowds of people walking around in a ring. Thank you. If you see this dear Mrs. Equiton, tell her I bring the horoscope myself. One must be so careful these days. Now, this sort of gypsy presence in the wasteland is important because uh, Madame Cesatris is obviously, uh, um, you know, someone who is getting more, more prominence in this particular cultural setting. Uh, and then the reference to different sets, thing, you know, uh, pearls over his eyes, so, you know, the references to, uh, you know, all kinds of literary texts, the references to Spencer, the references to, uh, you know, Shakespeare, the references to the Wheel of Fortune. But what is important for us is for over here to find the different kinds of cards which are being mentioned. The Hangman card. Uh, which is immediately followed by the, the warning against water, fear death by water, fear drowning. 
right? So again, uh, the whole image of drowning in a certain kind of experience, the whole image of drowning and being bogged down by water is something which comes up in, in, in this particular poem. And then the reference to the crowds of people walking around in a ring, right? So the crowds of people walking in a ring uh, indicates no forward movement, indicates no mobility in the, in the, in the proper sense of the term. Uh, it actually indicates stagnation. There's a, there's a massive crowd of people, but all they do is walk around in a ring. There's no forward movement, there's no mobility as such. And then of course, the references to Mr. Equiton, uh, which is uh, a very, very allegorical and symbolic term, a symbolic name. Uh, and then uh, the, the speaker is said uh, to convey to Mrs. Equiton that, you know, Mrs. Cesotris, Madam Cesotris will bring the horoscope himself or herself, right? So one must be so careful uh, these days. Now, uh, and the last section uh, of this particular uh, opening is, it, it has an image of a very, very cinematic image of an unreal city. So again, uh, it's a long shot of an unreal city which is being consumed by fog, right? So fog becomes important, again, a symbol of stagnation, a symbol of lack of movement, a symbol of lack of clarity. It becomes something of an opacity which is consuming the metropolis. Everything is opaque, every person is opaque. There's no transparency available. So the fog in this particular scene becomes a very uh, symbolic presence, a very symbolic condition. And obviously, it adds to the spectrality of the setting. Everything becomes more spectral in a foggy condition. Everything becomes more almost supernatural, quasi-supernatural at least in a foggy condition. But the point that we should spend some time with at the beginning is the whole idea of the unreal city. It's not really a real city, right? So it's something which is unreal. It's something which is experienced even as an unreal city. We cannot connect to it at a human level in a real sense. There's no cognitive connect. There's always a cognitive dissonance which has been produced over here. And that cognitive dissonance is important for us to unpack. Because if we take a look at the image following after that, following right after that, you know, uh, scene of Unreal City, under the brown fog of a winter dawn. So the winter dawn is producing a brown fog and everything looks very, very unreal and spectral in that kind of uh, setting. You know, it's almost like hallucinatory, you know, it's, it's like hallucination in the morning and you cannot see through the hallucination. Everything is hallucinatory and that impairs your sight, you know, your you, you sense of sight, your sense of looking, your sense of understanding, cognitive understanding gets more and more interrupted with that translucent, uh, with that fog that has uh, been created by the winter dawn. And then of course the London Bridge has been referred to, a crowd flowed over London Bridge, so many I had not thought death had undone so many. Now this is an important image because it is also a reminder of this very Dantesque crowd of dead people waiting to get into heaven or hell, waiting in the ring, the limbo ring, uh, to move into this uh, uh, destined space in the end. So these are people who are not really fully dead, they're not really free despite being dead, right? And look at the way in which how Eliot uses the Dante reference of this limbo people, people moving, uh, people waiting to move to the dead land, uh, you know, somewhere stuck between life and death. That mythical image is being used over here uh, and topicalized and contextualized and recontextualized. And this is what I mean by the mythic method used by Eliot over here. Uh, so that Dante image of people who are not fully dead, but you know, waiting to be dead, waiting to go on to the uh, Netherland or the Deadland, the underworld, right? Uh, and liminally waiting there. That image is used over here to talk about the Londoners because these are Londoners, these are survivors and mourners. So they're, they're not really dead physically, but they're, they're dead existentially. So they're waiting to die. So we have this entire city of mourners and survivors who are just waiting to die. No one is looking forward to living a full life. So everyone is waiting to die. And that, that informs, that invests. Uh, a liminality and a stagnation in this particular demography. So the demography in this particular section is about Londoners waiting to die. So the only thing they look forward to is dead. And so in the whole idea of uh, being undone by death becomes important because physically, metabolically, these people are living, they're existing, but they've been undone by death. There's been such a massive consumption of death, such a massive consumption, consumption of trauma that they have been deadened and numbed. And this numbness becomes a very important metropolitan effect, right? It's just entire metropolis becomes a product, production of numbness, right? And that's something which we find even in uh, Mrs. Jalloway by, by Virginia Woolf. Numbness becomes the chief cognitive and existential condition that characterizes uh, and connects all the people, all the mourners and survivors in the metropolis. Okay, sighs, short and infrequent, were exhaled. So again, there's a sense of despair and sighs are being exhaled, which are short and infrequent. And each man fixed his eyes before his feet, flowed up the hill and down King William Street to where St. Mary Woolnot kept the hours 
with a dead sound on a final stroke of nine. So each man is looking at his feet and walking down the King William Street, while the St. Mary will not, uh, you know, has a dead sound on this final stroke of nine. It's a church bell which is ringing, but it sounds like a death knell, right? So every church bell sounds like a death knell over here. Everything is a reminder of the imminent death. Right, so every person is living over here, they are not really living, they are just existing and waiting to die. Now the final image in this particular section is interesting, uh, it is an image from Baudelaire uh, and the flowers of evil flew them all, but the image of you know, some one person recognizing another person, Stetson, you who are with me the, the ships of Malay. So the ships of Malay, the battle of Malay is a mythical battle, right? It was fought many, it was like a prehistoric battle. But look at the way in which the real war is being referred to through a mythic method and that becomes important. That's what I mean by mythic method. There is a series of oblique references which are being used over here and the oblique quality is interesting because that invests a, a degree of translucence in representation of politics. It is not completely clear what is being referred to. There is a reference to the real mythical battle or is a reference to the uh, closer uh, war that has just happened, right? So, you know, both are equally present and hence ambivalence. Ambivalent, ambivalence becomes a very big uh, productive process. An entire poem becomes a production of ambivalence, uh, you know, speaking level of narrative and representation. And this image is interesting, one person recognizing another person, Stetson, that corpse you planted in last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year or has a sudden frost disturbed its bed? So again, look at the way in which the corpse has been referred to, corpse which has been planted in a garden, so corpse becomes a vegetation. And not just that, it is beginning to sprout, it is beginning to grow. So again, the growth over here is a growth of deadness. The bloom over here is a bloom of deadness, it is not really a regenerative bloom, it is a bloom of uh, the continuation of deadness, the continuation of despair, the continuation of annihilation. So every growth, every production over here is a production of waste and a production in waste, okay? And that is a very important uh, uh, point that I want you to sort of spend some time with and hence it is a wasteland. The entire landscape is a landscape of waste, it is a wasted landscape, it is an exhausted landscape, it is a, tr a traumatized landscape, it is an innovated and liquid created landscape, right? So even the dead body away, even the corpse away, that becomes a soul signifier of production. So you can see how the dead body, uh, the waste body, the waste human body, that becomes an image which will sprout and bloom this year or has a sudden frost disturbed its bed or give the dog far hands that friend to man uh, with his nails, he will dig it up again. So there are references to the Renaissance the theatre, the Spanish tragedy, etc. The hypocrite letter, Mont Samuel, Mont Fair. Right? So again, there is a reference to Baudelaire over here. So my friend, uh, you know, my identical person, you hypocrite. So you know, this reference to a person, this reference to another person that you recognize and address as a friend, but then that address also becomes a reminder, a painful reminder uh, of a loss, of mourning and of course of deadness. So the, this dead body image over here is important and I want to pay some attention to it because a dead body becomes a vehicle, a symbol of growth over here. So that, that obviously means that the entire ontology, the entire quality of growth is disturbed in wasteland because the only growth available is true deadness, is with deadness and hence it becomes a more and more consolidated wasteland. So every production over here becomes a production in waste, a production with waste, right? So uh, and that becomes more and more consolidated as a wasteland. So the land becomes more waste, uh, the fertility becomes wasted, the landscape becomes wasted and of course the mindscape becomes wasted. So if you take a look at the uh, demography again, uh, people who are sighing, sighs short and infrequent who are exiled. So everything, everyone is sighing, it's a sigh of despair, it's a despairing demography, right? Everyone is sighing, everyone is despairing, everyone is moaning, everyone is just counting the clock to die. It's a series, it's a, it's a crowd of mourners and survivors who are very similar to the image in Dante's Divine Comedy of people waiting to die, people are waiting to be ported and shipped over to the netherland. They are not completely dead but they are not alive either. So that liminal condition is something which is being represented over here in a very painful series of painful images, okay? So I stop at this point today, we ended with the first section and the next section we move on to the game of chess which has lots of Spencerian uh, you know, references to Fairy Queen and Edmund Spencer which we will unpack in some details in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.